Welcome to Who's in STEM. I'm Ken Ono, your host and the STEM advisor to the Provost and the Marvin Rosenblum Professor of Mathematics at the University of Virginia. On Who's in STEM, our goal is to evoke flights of imagination and wonder by showcasing the cornucopia of all that is STEM at UVA. The marvelous world of UVA science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now science usually advances on the work of thousands, over generations, fine-tuning and extending the scope of understanding. But from time to time, creative fireballs, think Newton, Einstein, they burst onto the scene propelling science forward. And just like we celebrate and honor our scientific heroes, we also celebrate extraordinary STEM achievements. Some of my personal favorites. As a mathematician, the Pythagorean theorem about right triangles. You all know it. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. How about Newton's discovery of gravity? And how about Einstein equating energy and mass with his famous equation E equals MC squared? Or the discovery of DNA, the genetic code of life? This discovery, thanks to the Human Genome Project led by UVA alum Francis Collins, has transformed the field of medicine. And the chances are quite good that this scientific achievement has played a role in your personal health care. But let's go back to the discovery of DNA. Let's talk about Watson and Crick. These two men won the 1962 Nobel Prize for Medicine for their discovery of the structure of DNA as a double helix, right? It's the two intertwined strands of base pairs, the AT and the CG pairs, that form the code of life. What you might not know is that there's a dark side to this historic achievement. There is a hidden lady of DNA, a forgotten heroine who many today believe was wrongfully left out. Rosalind Franklin was a British chemist who specialized in X-ray crystallography. Her mesmerizing X-ray diffraction images identified key properties of DNA. And Watson and Crick relied heavily on them, on these images, for their work for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize. Rosalind, on the other hand, died without fame and without recognition. Now, what's fitting about this is that Watson and Crick won the Nobel Prize in 1962. And that's a famous year in the annals of American science. You see, Americans tuned into radio and television coverage of John Glenn's historic space flight in his Mercury 7 capsule. On February 20th, Glenn became the first American to orbit Earth in outer space. And he was celebrated. There was a ticker tape parade for Glenn, a ceremony at the White House. He was a superstar representing the absolute best in science. But hidden away out of sight was Katherine Johnson, a black woman who performed some of the calculations that NASA required for Glenn's flight. Now Johnson, like Rosalind Franklin, were both very important for these scientific achievements, but both were hidden away. Today, I'm excited to speak with Margot Lee Shetterly, the author of Hidden Figures, which is about the black women who worked as computers during the space race. Her book is the basis of the famous film by the same name. My guess is that many of you have seen it. And this film, Hidden Figures, tells this story of Johnson and astronaut John Glenn. Margot is with us today because she is also the director, the founding director of the Human Computer Project a nonprofit established to recover the names and accomplishments of women like Katherine Johnson, who worked as computers, mathematicians, scientists, and engineers from the 1930s through the 1980s. And by the way, she is a who. She's an alum of the McIntyre School of Commerce. Margot, welcome to Who's in STEM. Ken, it's really great to be on today's podcast. Well, thank you for being here. Pleasure is ours. We're also excited to have Mar Hicks with us today. Mar is new to the University of Virginia. Mar is an associate professor of data science at UVA and the author of Programmed Inequality, which examines how Britain lost early strength in computing by discarding women programmers. Mar, welcome to UVA. Excited to have you on the faculty and with us today in conversation. Thanks, Ken. It's an honor to be here today with both of you. Together... Margot, Mar, and I are partnering, and we are launching a project here at UVA called the Human Computer Project Census. 
It's a project where UVA students will work on a large scale to recover historical and biographical information about the female professionals who worked on early NASA programs. But before we talk about that, let's get to know both Margot and Mar. Margot, as an alum, you just received a great prize, the Maxine Platzer Lynn Women's Center 2023 Prize as the Distinguished Alum of the Year. Tell us a little bit about your time at UVA and how, how UVA has influenced you in your career. Thanks, Ken. I, I'd say maybe the first thing that I'd say about my experience at UVA is that I made some very, very close friends, and some of those are still very good friends today. So I will always be grateful to UVA for the friendships that I had here. And then I am very grateful to the McIntyre School of Commerce. I got a very strong, really solid business education, but also an education in critical thinking and research skills um, that stood me very well during my time on Wall Street, during my time uh, working in the internet industry, and also in my time uh, my time now as, as a writer and a researcher. So thanks always to the McIntyre School of Commerce for that wonderful preparation it gave me. Excellent answer. Mar, you recently joined the School of Data Science, the brand new building that's going to open in April. Can you tell us about your path and why you're excited? I hope you're excited. I don't put words in your mouth. Why, why you're excited to join us here on the faculty in the School of Data Science at UVA? Yeah, I'd love to. My path to the School of Data Science has been a little bit circuitous. Um, early in my career, I worked in computing for a little while. And then I went back to graduate school for a PhD in history where I studied how technology and labor interacted down through the decades to produce our current technological and social systems. So I'm a historian by training, which you might think is a little unusual for somebody for data science. who yeah. works right. at a data science school. But the reason I was recruited to the School of Data Science at UVA is because they're really trying to make sure that in training the next generation of technologists, that they take a holistic view and educate folks broadly about not just technology and data, but also where the ideas that underlie those things come from and how these systems and tools powerfully shape society, sometimes for the better and also sometimes for the worse. So my role is to try to help students understand the history of these technologies that they're building upon so that they don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And one big part of that, as Margot has shown so powerfully, is uncovering what actually happened in the past so that we can truly understand where we've been, where we are, and where we might be going or where it might be possible for us to go as a society if we don't content ourselves with the same old patterns of privilege and profit that we've seen again and again and again. Wow, that's great. I, I think you touched on a, a very important point here. The School of Data Science recently had its undergraduate program approved and will soon be enrolling students. And as I understand, you're playing an important role in devising what the curricular requirements will be. So will there be some course requirements related to uh, the implications of data science in society? Absolutely. That's a critical part of what we call the four plus one model in data science. And one of those four things is um, essentially value, ethics, uh, what we might call the study of data and society. It's really, really critical for the School of Data Science to impart to all of its students that Technology is only useful in as much as it is applied. So we have to get the application part right. And that requires knowing a lot more than just the technical side of things. So, Margot, turning to the project at hand, what is the Human Computer Project? What are your intentions and what are your long term goals? Ken, well, the Human Computer Project really came out of the fact that while the movie was about three women and the book was about four women, that this really was a story about thousands of women who worked at NASA and 
in industry, technology, and, and technical industries in general in the 20th century as computers, mathematicians, data analysts. There were a number of different names for this particular job category, which involved before electronic computers doing the computations that were responsible for this kind of bureaucratic, large format research and development that we saw in the space program, that we saw in the communications industry, that we saw in much of the federal government. So the goal of the Human Computer Project is really twofold. One is to recover the stories of the individual women so that, like the book and the movie, like Mars' book, that we recover their stories and the work that they did, their contributions. But the second thing is to really create a large data set, a labor data set, that we look at these women and when they entered the workplace, what their career trajectories were over time, the factors that led to their success, where they met roadblocks. Um, that we really understand them as a labor pool that contributed to the rise of the 20th century. And once we do that, I think that we can draw some conclusions that will help us understand the future, as Mar was talking about, the future of our STEM labor force and the future of the participation of women in the economy. So this is where University of Virginia enters the story, Margot. It's our great fortune that, that you approached us with the idea of uh, offering in partnership the launch of the Human Computer Project Census. And the idea is that we will be hiring UVA students to serve as interns to carry out the first phase of, of this work. What will that look like? Well, Ken, you know, I've been nursing this project for a number of years, and I am so excited to finally have the opportunity to bring it to fruition um, with the kind of smart, energetic students that we find here at UVA, um, especially as a UVA alum. I'm very proud to, to bring this project here. I think it's a really exciting opportunity because it's interdisciplinary. We're really looking for students, first of all, who have a real interest in this history. What we're going to do is to train these undergraduate students to go out and to recover the information of these women, to write profiles of these women, and then to help take the data that we find about them and contribute that to the data set. So we're going to be looking for people who have very strong independent research skills, who have very good writing skills, who have analytical skills, who are able to take direction and then work independently who have a creative sense because a lot of this really does require, you know, finding a door when there is the window is closed or I guess opening the window when the door is closed, however you want to put it. It's very much an open form kind of work, the kind of work that you would do in, in any kind of a workplace. And I think that's one of the things that's so exciting. It really is professional work. Offered to students. It we're is a on quest. A quest. It's an adventure. We're, it, it, we're not, it's we're a not quest. putting entries in an Excel spreadsheet. We're on an adventure. We are on an adventure to extract some meaning and some some real world analysis application from the results of this our quest. Thank you, Margot. So Mar, I have to say, when Margot and I were first brainstorming about this idea. You were very quickly brought to our attention, and I think Margo and I were chatting. We are so lucky to have Mar Hicks at the University of Virginia, and I think, Margo, you were even saying, wow, I didn't know she was at UVA. The last time I saw her, she was giving a lecture at Harvard. So, Mar, together with Margo, you are a leader in uncovering these stories. Your specialty is uh, uh, in British history, but your expertise is in uncovering and uh, acknowledging the stories of the women computer programmers or women human computers. So tell us, what kinds of activities do you envision being fundamental to the student internship program? Sure. And first, let me just say it's it's an honor and really a dream come true to be working with the both of you on this project. I was absolutely delighted when I got the uh, the email and um, yeah, the sort of activities that participants in this project are going to be engaged in are going to be uh, really exciting, I think. I'm biased because they're going to be involved in primary historical research, really creating new knowledge. They're going to be reaching back into the past to reshape what we think we know about the history of women in technology. 
They're going to, as Margot said, work to recover the names of as many women as possible who worked at NASA in this capacity. And then they're going to create biographical sketches and associated data and records and stories about these women. And one thing that I think is especially exciting is that one of the uh, research techniques that they'll have the opportunity to engage in is creating oral histories. So they're actually, as Margot did for her book, going to be creating new archives that then potentially other researchers will come along and use to create new histories of what happened in this era, in this space, and how it impacts, you know, everything that we think about computing then and now. Right. So I I imagine 20-year-old UVA students in the living rooms of family members who will be retelling the stories of like an aunt or a grandmother, and maybe even in some cases not having complete appreciation for the past. I I have to believe that will be not only rewarding for us as our project, but for the student, certainly for the families. I really think so. And it's funny that you bring up people with aunts and grandmothers and so on, because one of the things that I've run into, and I'm sure Marco has as well, is the minute that we start talking about this sort of thing, people come out of the woodwork to say, oh, my grandmother did stuff like that. My aunt did stuff like that. My mother had a job for a while doing something like that. You can't write fast enough to keep up with the conversation. Absolutely. You know, it's it is it's amazing. I mean, so much of this history right now resides in photo albums, in funeral programs, in the memories of people who are in their 80s and 90s and older. And our job here is to really go out, seek that archival information, you know, commit it to history and then to take a look at it and try to understand what it's trying to tell us about our present moment and the future. Yeah, there's so much that comes to mind here as I, as I reflect on your comments. And I, I want to ask, is there someone that you met that you interviewed along the way whose story was just so compelling that you couldn't go to bed that night? I mean, could you share with us, both of you, a story of someone you met that just speaks volumes to the importance of this project? One story that really stands out for me, Ken, uh, there was a woman named Dorothy Hoover, and Dorothy Hoover started working in the West Area Computing Unit, the, the segregated all-black West Area Computing Unit at NASA Langley, uh, then called the Langley Laboratory, in 1943, just like Dorothy Vaughn. And so when I was doing my research, you know, and, I, and doing the research from the 1940s to the 1950s and looking at a lot of the NASA source documents, I kept turning up information about this woman in memos who was a GS9 research scientist back in 1951. It turned out it was this woman, Dorothy Hoover, who had done work in this theoretical, you know, very advanced, you know, mathematically advanced group of engineers and who had gone on to do some graduate study at the University of Michigan. She came back. She went uh, to the federal government. She worked at the National Weather Service. Then she worked at NASA Goddard in, in Maryland. And she she ended up living a very tragic life. She lost two children. Mm. Um, she died alone mm. in Washington, D.C. And I discovered this because a journalist named Lisa Frazier Page had written a profile of her for the Washington Post back in, I think, 2002. Mm. And so it was really putting together these two sides of this woman's story who really had an extraordinary career as a scientist, as a mathematician, who was always really drawn to this, the more theoretical aspect of things as much as the applied math and applied science. And um, it really was a case of both her work being very interesting and also the twists and turns of, of her, her life. life right? Yeah. So she, her yeah. story always stays with me. One really memorable meeting for me was meeting a woman named Lorna Cockhane. And when I met her, she was in her 90s. She had been one of the operators of the Colossus code-breaking computers at Bletchley Park in the UK during World War II. The intelligence provided by those code-breaking computers literally turned the tide of the war in the Allies' favor at D-Day. One of the things that was so interesting to me about interviewing her, well, it was twofold. The first is that 
I really had to convince her that I actually valued what she had to say and that I wanted to interview her. She kept just saying, are you sure you're not wasting your time? Are you sure you really want to talk to me? And I assured her, yes, I really do. But this is the sort of thing, and I'm, I'm sure Margot has probably seen this as well. When people are devalued in a certain way and the work they do is devalued, it has a tendency to actually swallow their stories, to hide their stories. And the other thing that she said that I thought was really, really important is that she didn't glamorize the war. She didn't glamorize the past. She reflected on World War II, and one of the final things she said to me was, they said it was the war to end all wars, mm. but it wasn't. We're still in wars all over the place. And as a historian of computing, I think it's so important to remember that these computers started out as weapons of war and that history means something. And we should always kind of maybe just have that in the back of our minds as we're talking about all of the wonderful things that these technologies can do. When did you interview her? Was that before or after Imitation Game? It was after. That's what's in the movie, right? That's in the yep. poster, right? Interestingly, it was after my book came out because the thing was your book helped create this moment in time where we went from sort of knowing vaguely that women had been participants in computing in a big way to that just being kind of an explosion in the culture. And like I said, your book was a huge part of this, the movie as well as, of course. And, and then, then Natalia Holt's book came out at yep. the same time and uh, Liza Mundy's book. Yeah, it was like everybody was interested in these women all of a sudden. Right. And so what I found was that right after then my book was published, women started kind of coming out and mm -hmm. finding me and saying, oh, I have a story too. And that was actually how I ended up finding Lorna and several other of the Colossus operators that I interviewed actually after my mm -hmm. book came out. Right. Well, I think it's so exciting because we can just keep them in our database and, you know, fill, fill them out. There's a project that just happened, very similar to what we're doing here, um, at Virginia Tech that they've done the work to uncover people. Like there are a lot of organizations that are doing the work to uncover people, which is really great because we can just over time tap into their networks, you know, get them to help us send the information to us. And I mean, because there's just there's so many women, there's so many networks. It's it's just we we can mobilize the energy of a lot of these ground forces that are out there and really just do a job of getting all these women that are, you know, some of whom I, I'm sure is in my case that a lot of them who have passed away since your book came out, um, but that, you know, that you got their information, which is really exciting. Yeah, as you were talking about, uh, was it Dorothy Hoover? Dorothy Hoover. Yeah. I was, you know, I, I was really <laughs> relating to that in a way because there are so many women, you know, who we, we've missed kind of the chance to get their stories, at yeah. least directly from them. And there was another person I was supposed to interview, and I didn't make it back to the UK in time, and she died. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just, um, you have to <laughs> kind of race the clock. Yeah, that that is the, the historian's, you know, uh, fear, right? Is that there's somebody who is alive who has a story and you're not going to get to them. And it always happens. I mean, it's, it's always going to happen, but it is sort of like, oh. I failed. You know, that's what it feels like. I failed. I definitely felt that way, yeah. <laughs> These are great stories, and, and, and I think with our project, we look forward to collecting more stories like this. How will data science, Mar, for example, in the curriculum that you're designing, how might data science inform this project, the Human Computer Project Census? Well, I think data science is poised to make an important contribution to this project, particularly as we spin up the undergraduate curriculum in data science and start showing undergrads how to collect and work with their own data, especially complex humanistic data like this. I would love for this project to be the bellwether for a new kind of data science, one that starts from humanistic concerns and is grounded in specific domain expertise from 
history, African-American studies, gender studies, public policy, instead of these areas being an afterthought to the data collection and system design that's driven sometimes more by tools and by computing's power or computing limitations. And the pursuit of profit. And, and that. the pursuit of profit. Well, thank you. So for students listening, so uh, one of the main reasons we are recording this episode and rushing it out is that we are looking for student interns. So this is a question for you, Margo. For students listening, what criteria and skills will you be looking for uh, in potential interns? Obviously, the students who are interested have to be very comfortable with software, um, data analysis software, at least some understanding. You know, obviously, a lot of the, the uh, hardcore skills will happen as we're doing the work. Um, excellent writing skills, analytical skills, again, independent research skills. And, um, you know, I think that we are looking for people who will come in with a set of skills, but really come out with sort of a real idea of how to transfer this knowledge to the next version of this project. This is really a pilot version here at UVA. Hopefully we will expand this, both the number of students, the other universities with UVA as a flagship, also the data set from simply the women at, of NASA to these women who worked at other organizations. But we really need people who see themselves as founders of this project and who are going to set the DNA of this project and really be able to transmit what they have learned, transmit the skills that they've, they've developed to, uh, to a next generation of researchers. Right. So long term, 10 years from now, when we've, when we've done a lot of the work, what would be the best outcome you could hope for coming from the Human Computer Project? I'd say there are probably two outcomes. Mm -hmm. One is that there are so many stories. I think there are, you know, I don't even know how many books um, that are in this data about women who have done extraordinary things. So I hope that, you know, I'm sitting down 10 years from now and I've got a stack of books about the women that we've uncovered to this process. And then I also hope that for social science researchers, for economists, for labor researchers, for employers, anybody who is in any way interested in the composition of the STEM workforce, the future of the STEM workforce, how to, how to fill their labor needs under, you know, challenging economic circumstances, where to get the best people no matter what. Um, hopefully, we've created something that will help them do their jobs a little bit better. And one of the outcomes that I'm really excited about, and hopefully, you know, at some point this spring, we'll be able to provide more details, we are going to be collecting a huge amount of information, and we are going to need expertise in curating and in preserving that information. So we have strong interest from a large, well-known uh, museum partner uh, that hopefully will help us to to really come up with a long-term preservation strategy for the the stories and the data that we're collecting. Great. So everyone stay tuned. Now, the logistics. Mar, what do students have to do to apply to the program? Well, the application is due uh, just about a month from now on March 11th. And it consists of two references, two writing samples, including a short biography, a resume, and also transcripts. They can be unofficial transcripts. So it's not too big a deal, but definitely get a jump on asking for those reference letters as soon as you can if you want to apply. You can find all the application details on the website, which will be linked in the show notes for this episode. So everybody, if you're thinking of applying, March 11th is a deadline. And if you're not thinking of applying but know someone that you think would be passionate about this work, and make no mistake, this is a passion project, please spread the good word. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Margot Omar, you're both fulfilling President Ryan's vision for UVA to be great and good in all that we do. Thank you both for your commitment to unearthing and celebrating the often overlooked contributions of women in STEM. And I'm Ken Ono, STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum professor of mathematics. And you've been listening to Who's in STEM.
Who's in STEM is a production of WTJU 91.1 FM and the Office of the Provost at the University of Virginia. Who's in STEM is produced by Katherine Kossaboom, Claire Curzan, Rhea Verma, Mary Garner McGee, and Ariane Ballou. Our music is composed and performed by Robert Schneider and John Ferguson of Apples and Stereo. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Listen and subscribe to Who's in STEM on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with another conversation about scientific technological innovation at the University of Virginia. Thank you.